Good morning and welcome to Marvel Gold's investor webinar and conference call to discuss the Evolution Energy Minerals IPO. All attendees are in a listen only mode. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the Q&A panel within Zoom. I'll now hand over to Marvel Gold Managing Director, Phil Hoskins. Over to you, Phil. Thanks, Nathan and NWR for the opportunity and uh, thanks everybody for dialing in uh, on this Monday morning. Um, so I'm the Managing Director of Marvel Gold, um, but over the last seven years, I've been uh, involved in the development of the Chalalo Graphite Project, uh, which is now going into Evolution Energy Minerals. I'll be a, a non-exec director of that company moving forward and um, I really just wanted to step through the story. Uh, Marvel will be a shareholder of Evolution moving forward. Uh, there's also a number of Marvel shareholders that have participated in the IPO. Uh, so I wanted to be able to step through, uh, step through that today and um, yeah, answer any questions anyone's got ahead of uh, what will be a very exciting uh, IPO tomorrow. Uh, so Evolution is looking to be uh, a sustainable graphite develop developer for the global green economy. So we'll step through that. A uh, very important slide here. Uh, so after raising 22 million, repaying the, uh, the private equity group that um, that Marvel or, or Graphics um, uh, had uh, a debt with. Uh, Evolution will start with $10.5 million in the bank. Um, and the shareholder list there is very important. So Marvel at 31%, um, Arch Sustainable Resources Fund at 25%. And there's 57% of the stock uh, that's going to be escrowed for the first 12 months. And the top 20 shareholders hold 75% uh, of, uh, of the shares. So it's uh, an incredibly tight book. Um, incredibly tight capital structure, and we'll be coming on with an uh, enterprise value of $21 million, which is incredibly cheap, and uh, we'll walk through the, uh, the peer comps uh, later in the presentation. Just from a board and management point of view, earlier this year when we were seeking to spin the asset off, I wanted to bring in people with, um, uh, with graphite expertise. It can't be underestimated how important it is to understand the graphite space um, in trying to figure out how to, to best make money out of your products. and um, and commercialise your asset. And um, uh, bringing in Trevor Benson, who's had six years experience with another Tanzanian graphite developer, Walkabout Resources, uh, was very important uh, to the company. He's been in, um, in the office sort of four to five months, uh, getting up to speed with the project and, um, and understanding um, where, where he wants to take it. Um, also got Michael Borgignon as an executive director, uh, another real critical appointment um, Michael's uh, background is um, in projects and has built a number of uh, uh, projects in Africa over the last 10 years. But I guess most importantly to our story uh, is that he was uh, involved in the construction of Syra Resources, uh, the Lama project in Mozambique. So the only guy uh, in the Western world sort of outside China to have built a graphite project in the last 10 years. So to have him on board with us, having uh, learned from some of the things that uh, happened through Syra. Um, particularly around the, the pre-marketing work and those sorts of things is a, a real boon for our company. Um, and Amanda Van Dyke, the Managing Director of the Arch Sustainable Resources Fund, coming in as a non-exec director um, and as Arch's representative. Uh, on the graphite market advisory side as well, which uh, again is key to, to commercialising our products, um, Chris Whiteley with over 25 years graphite marketing experience is um, incredibly important to our ability to sell our products um, into Western markets, which will be a, a real target of ours um, with the, the theme of ex-China uh, moving forward. Um, so just a summary snapshot of the project, uh, the DFS uh, that was completed in early 2020 uh, encapsulates a concentrate plus value-added product strategy. Um, the project itself is fully permitted with a mining license and environmental approvals. Um, what really sets the project apart though is the product quality and, uh, and the unique graphite signature. Um, not only is it a globally significant flake size with over almost 60% uh, greater than plus 80 mesh, um, we've done all the downstream test work to understand that it performs well in the value added applications that we're targeting. Um, based on reserves only, we already have an 18 year mine life um, and a number of targets to potentially turn that into a multi-decade mine life. And that'll be one of the aims of the company within the first 12 months will be to substantially grow that resource moving forward. Uh, we've got an advanced downstream business already uh, looking to produce expandable graphite and micronized graphite in the early years of the, the project's life. Um, these are highly value accretive. Uh, we've done the marketing work to understand who the customers are, what their specification requirements are, and we're also looking to use proven technology to produce those products. So the MP, MPV numbers there, 323 million US, 
uh, which is almost 500 million Australian dollars, 34% IRR, um, and uh, very healthy margins, all driven by uh, the product quality, uh, course flake, and, and the value add, um, producing around 50,000 tonnes per annum. And um, rather than ramping that up to, to very large numbers, what we would like to do is participate in the value added uh, downstream processing to, to really maximise the margins from what we are producing. And we will be looking to go into other uh, downstream options moving forward. Uh, with a particular em emphasis on uh, on battery materials uh, and spherical graphite. Um, Arch is probably the big news over the last couple of months. It's been a long time in the making. Um, um, Amanda first approached me probably 14 months ago um, to uh, uh, to want to get involved in this project. It's been a lot of due diligence. Uh, they visited site in May, um, and they're actually uh, over in Tanzania as we speak, um, just concluding a, a site visit to the project. Um, uh, they're coming in with an $8 million investment, also purchasing a small royalty, so a good cash injection for the company as the cornerstone investor. Um, but they've also looked to, to cordon aside another $25 million US uh, for ongoing support uh, for the project moving forward. And what's really key in the investment deed, if you've um, been through the prospectus, is um, Arch looking to secure co-investment rights for a lot of shareholders into their fund. And where we're talking about sort of the, the who's who of uh, fund managers around the world uh, who are looking to invest into Arch's fund and Arch sort of provide the, the ESG due diligence, if you like, for these groups. So they don't need their in-house um, due diligence on, on the ESG matters. And, uh, so what we hope going forward, we've committed to um, a substantial ESG program uh, with Arch over the first six months um, uh, post-IPO and uh, we get to the end of that um, and we think that we'll be able to attract uh, a number of these green and sustainable resources funds to the company um, uh, to the point where uh, we think that will help us fund construction. So uh, a real real asset to have Arch on board with us. Um, ESG is at the, the centre of what we're looking to do as evolution. Um, ESG, for those that aren't aware, is environment, social and, um, and governance metrics. Um, they're things that the, the industry does very well, but probably doesn't report on them. Um, transparently or well, all those sorts of things. I've certainly learned a lot about it in the last six months. Um, it's fantastic to have a group like Arch there to hold our hands through it. Um, but it is uh, absolutely what big fund managers are looking for these days is uh, companies that uh, not only do the right thing, but uh, are reporting transparently about doing the right thing. And um, uh, certainly the ESG program we've committed to over the next six months is extensive. It meets uh, all the criteria of the key uh, uh, key standard setters, you've got the equator principles, IFC standards, there's new global tailing dam standards. Um, we'll be meeting all of those and, and that will uh, essentially, in our view, um, put us on, on the map as um, the most sustainable graphite uh, developer in the world. Uh, we are also looking to, to try and achieve net zero carbon. Uh, we'll be reporting on a number of initiatives uh, in that regard. Um, and equally, um, uh, with uh, well, the entire board has um, uh, agreed to stand for uh, re-election if uh, we breach any of our ESG policies. Uh, just the summary of the project again, fully permitted for construction. Uh, not very often you get uh, get a company uh, IPOing at this stage. Uh, so we've got uh, mining license, environmental approvals, uh, very good DFS uh, with $21 million spent on it to date. Um, excellent flake size, uh, proven performance and value added. <clears throat> excuse me, applications and an 18 year mine life. We've got a lot of upside to the resource. So this is the resource here. You can see 20 million tonnes at 9.9% TGC. Um, a hell of a lot of upside through the electromagnetics here. So um, there's over 34 kilometres of strike that we, uh, that we know is uh, high conductance targets. Uh, and in the months following um, the IPO, uh, we'll be looking to uh, release the exploration program there. Uh, just some of the DFS metrics here. As I mentioned, 18 year mine life, $323 million NPV, 34% uh, IRR. Um, and over here on the right is uh, a lot of the partners that we've worked with uh, over the seven years of the development of the project to date. Uh, you've got Vega and one of China's leading uh, metallurgists. You've got SGS and ALS in the Western world, uh, AETC out of, um, uh, out of the US. Uh, China National Building Materials and Sonoma. So 
Um, these are all big groups. Uh, we've been able to confirm our ability to produce our high quality products, uh, not just at a concentrate stage, but also at a downstream stage. So I'm highly confident in our ability to hit these numbers um, and in the marketing work that's gone on. Um, just further on that, I'd say the, the biggest risk uh, to any graphite project is the ability to produce the product that you, uh, that you say you can. Um, so uh, down here is the, the image you'll see in a lot of graphite company presentations, your, your mesh size or flake size, the percentage of your product in each of those categories. Um, as you can see, the course of flake attracts a much higher price. So recognising that there was the key risk as to whether you can produce these products. Um, we've done our full DFS level test work at two laboratories, both ALS in Perth um, and SGS Lakefield in Canada. Um, we've done pilot plant runs, up to 30 tonne pilot plant runs to uh, uh, confirm that uh, when it scales up to, um, uh, to full production uh, or, or bigger bits of equipment that um, we'll also be able to uh, produce the products that we say we can. Um, and it is a, a unique graphite signature that has uh, been confirmed um, in these value added applications. You can't just um, say you've got a plus 80 mesh product and it's going to perform well in fire retardant applications. You've actually got to go and do the test to make sure that it can. The other aspect of the product quality that's um, a real advantage to our, our project is its ability to go to plus 99% purity um, without uh, chemical intervention, so no harmful acids, um, and also without thermal purification. Um, so the ability to get there through flotation, uh, we believe in the future could be uh, the future of purification. A lot of those downstream products, expandable graphite, um, battery anode materials all need to be purified to reach um, uh, the plus 99%. So uh, for us to be able to, uh, to get there through flotation, um, we believe could, uh, uh, could make Chilalo the greenest graphite on the planet. Just a little bit about the graphite market, and um, obviously everyone knows the story about electric vehicles and um, exponential growth expected in um, uh, from graphite um, driven by that. Um, you've also got uh, graphite's main use in refractories and um, uh, the continued growth in, in steel from COVID infrastructure stimulus um, is important moving forward and, and longer term also the infrastructure needs of um, Asia and Africa uh, moving to urbanisation. So um, there's some really good long-term trends, but obviously over the next 10 years, lithium ion batteries are uh, going to be the, the main mega trend driving uh, the demand for graphite. Um, the other thing that's happening in the graphite market, it's been happening for a number of years, but it's um, really uh, taking shape over the last 12 months is the evolution of the supply side. Um, roughly 70% of the world's graphite comes from China at the moment. It's predominantly fine flake. Um, there's not a lot of coarse flake left um, in China, uh, Shandong province has a little bit, but um, uh, due to environmental uh, restrictions, the, the mining there has been curtailed. Um, so it's a real opportunity for a new supplier of, of course, flake graphite. And, and the other thing is how end users, particularly in Europe, and I'm sure the rest of the Western world will follow suit, is how uh, increasingly important that ESG is and sustainability is to those customers. Um, you've got sustainability and traceability being um, key measures that um, the EU are looking for um, in being able to supply graphite products into, uh, into Europe. So um, that's uh, the big part of our strategy is uh, making sure that we can demonstrate those things um, to become a supplier of choice into those economies. Uh, this shows the uh, uh, makeup of a battery. So you can see that um, uh, graphite is, uh, is dominating the battery there, over 50% of the battery as made up of graphite. This is why Elon Musk uh, thinks it should be called a nickel graphite battery, not a, a lithium ion battery. So um, uh, clearly a lot, of, uh, a lot of graphite used in the battery there. The other thing of note here is um, whilst there's a number of different battery chemistries um, uh, that get around that use different amounts of nickel or trying to eliminate the cobalt and, and these things, one thing that's um, the mainstay is the anode. So um, over 95% of the anode is made up of graphite. Um, some of that's natural synthetic graphite um, and some of that's, sorry, some of that's synthetic graphite and some of that's um, natural spherical graphite, um, roughly 50-50. But as we um, move forward, the fact that synthetic graphite comes from uh, hydrocarbons and uh, again, the world um, is sort of moving away from that, that um, this uh, natural spherical graphite that, uh, that our product can produce will be, um, will be in demand. Uh, the image on the right there also shows that outside of just electric vehicles, 
um, just general energy technologies driving a, a number of these commodities. But you look um, uh, look at graphite through to 2050 and uh, yeah, huge amounts demanded. So we're definitely in the right space at the right time. I uh, mentioned Europe, uh, Europe's uh, decision at the end of last year. Um, they've handed down the EU taxonomy for sustainable activities. Um, and this is where responsible sourcing of materials, reduction in CO2, traceability back to the mine site, um, and those sorts of things is very important. Um, we're looking to build what's called an IRMA accredited mine. Uh, so the International Raw Materials Association, uh, getting an accreditation with them um, that, uh, that all those things, uh, all those boxes are ticked. Um, certainly Arch being based in Europe, um, this is what they've uh, been living and breathing for the last few years. Certainly when I've traveled through the UK um, to the project um, or, or conferences and other things, ESG sat at the top of the, uh, the list of uh, things people are interested in. And you've got companies like Daimler Chrysler and VW uh, already saying that they won't, um, won't be taking uh, raw materials that um, can't be proven to be you know, traceable and, and sustainable back to their source. Um, so just changing uh, gears a little bit to talk about our uh, value-added strategies. So within our DFS, our intention was to uh, take graphite concentrate in Tanzania uh, through a partnership with uh, the world-leading expandable graphite manufacturer in China, uh, toll treat that into expandable graphite, and that involves uh, washing the graphite concentrate in, in acids and reagents, which uh, essentially insert themselves in between the flake layers um, that produces expandable graphite, which goes into a whole number of other uh, products, graphite foil for electronic devices, fire retardant building materials, um, and those sorts of things. And the intention was to uh, sell that expandable graphite to uh, Western customers that we've identified. Um, that remains a, a key strategy for the company moving forward, um, and we'll continue to uh, uh, further that relationship with our, our partner in China. Uh, micronized graphite, this is a way, I uh, mentioned that it's fine flake graphite that, um, that goes into lithium ion batteries. Um, fine flake is uh, generally a lower price than, than coarser flake. And so another way to maximize the uh, margins from our fine flake is to produce micronized graphite. And this is basically um, milling the graphite down to, to very small sizes. Um, we've got proven technology out of Canada uh, that we've done test work to, uh, to confirm uh, our ability to produce this product. And again, it's all about the marketing through Chris Whiteley, who's got 20 years experience in micronized graphite. Um, we've been introduced to a number of customers and um, the intention is to, uh, uh, to move as much fines into that market as, uh, as quickly as possible. The value add is, is excellent for a few hundred dollars. Uh, you're taking uh, fines from uh, circa 500 to $700 a tonne um, up to two or $3,000 a tonne. So, um, uh, a really good value add. We've done the technical work, we've done the marketing work, um, and another strategy that we think is going to maximise the margin for our, our high quality product. Um, the next step, um, and um, one thing that we hadn't in the previous, I guess, reincarnation of this asset uh, hadn't done was um, uh, the downstream battery anode material studies. Um, certainly recognise that um, uh, that's a huge area that the market's interested in, and, and so Evolution will be looking to get into that. Um, between Trevor and myself, um, our market connections are, are extensive. Uh, obviously, Chris Whiteley and, and advisors that we use in China as well. So we're able to tap into the people with the technical resources, um, and we'll be seeking to uh, to look to do studies to um, either participate in our own anode materials or or at least put our own graphite into those uh, anode materials moving forward. So differentiation, why are, we, uh, why are we different to everyone else? Um, our graphite products have been proven. Uh, we've done the work. I mentioned two different laboratories doing the full MET test work. We've then taken that concentrate and we've gone to all the different labs in Germany and the US, um, in China, uh, to confirm that we can produce uh, the high value graphite products that we're, uh, we're looking to produce. I uh, also mentioned the 99% purity product, um, which is very unique and, and we think could be the future of purification. Um, uh, the production of green graphite is exactly that, um, being able to produce that product, but equally um, committing to an ESG program with Arch that um, uh, ensures that uh, customers can uh, trace all the way back and that they know transparently that we've um, produced this graphite um, in a sustainable way. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're committing to uh, 
uh, or try to, to get to a net zero carbon with the operation as well. Uh, we're not aware of any graphite operations that uh, can hit that mark. So certainly be working with Arch to, uh, to achieve that. Uh, the downstream business model, um, there's some companies that are, that are doing it in, in the battery space. Um, we're quite diversified and expandable, micronized and, and hopefully soon to be batteries. Um, there's a lot of margins to be made there. We've got the technical and the market understanding to be able to capitalize on those. So, um, uh, so look forward to that and an experienced team. You, as I mentioned, you can't underestimate um, eight years myself, six years with Trevor. Uh, Michael's built the only graphite project outside of China in the last 10 years. Um, and then experienced advisors like Chris Whiteley and our, and our Chinese advisors as well. So um, that's the only way that you can um, maximise the, uh, the margins from your product is to, to understand the market. So investment highlights, we, we are construction ready. As I mentioned before, floating off a DFS level uh, construction ready project that we can execute immediately if we, uh, if we had the funding. Uh, doesn't happen very much. Um, the commitment to sustainability, so uh, looking to, to get to a net zero carbon uh, outcome with the mine. Um, we genuinely are in a, a two-way market at the moment um, in terms of the, the demand side for graphite is, is booming with the transition to e-mobility and then the supply side, so moving away from that historical Chinese focus to sustainably source graphite. So we think we're perfectly placed to, uh, to capitalise on that. Um, and yeah, high value products. So you start with a coarse flake product that is amenable to these uh, downstream markets, then um, uh, that's how you can produce the margins that our, our DFS um, has identified. So a bit of a timeline there. Um, we've got a lot of news flow over the next few months, I'd say, um, capable of putting out an announcement once a week. We, are, we obviously don't want to flood the market, but we've got a lot to tell. Um, Trevor and Michael have, have been in the seat for a few months and um, we've been doing exploration in country. I look forward to reporting on that. Um, this ESG program, some key appointments moving forward, um, all aimed at making a final investment decision um, at some point in 2022. Um, Arch is certainly gung ho to do that, um, and um, and will be pushing us as uh, as hard as possible as well. Just on the the final slide here, um, just a bit of a peer comparison. Um, Evolution coming on with a, a 32 million market cap, um, only a $21 million EV. Um, it certainly doesn't deserve to be there. Um, it's, um, uh, well, it's a very high quality asset that really since, um, since early 2020, hasn't, it's sat inside a gold company uh, at the end of the day and it's been encumbered by a debt. And so these are some of the reasons why, um, why it's coming on uh, really as cheaply as it is. Um, we had to raise 22 million to be able to get uh, the nine and a half million dollar debt repaid, and um, uh, but all that is is past us now. The debt is um, is unencumbered, and um, uh, sorry, the asset is unencumbered. Uh, if you look at the peers here, though, um, sort of the, the Tanzanian peers with uh, with concentrate only, sort of a black rock in the middle here at two hundred million dollar market cap. Um, that's sort of where where this asset, I, I believe, deserves to be sitting. Um, a couple of guys over on the left here uh, have already gone down. Uh, downstream into um, uh, battery anode material studies and things. And, and certainly if we can uh, go down that route as well, then, then we should be pushing towards the left side of, uh, of this chart. Um, I won't jump into the appendices. Um, yeah, again, just wanted to thank everyone for uh, jumping on the call this morning. Um, happy to take any questions. And, and other than that, I think it's gonna be a really exciting, um, well, day tomorrow, and uh, but really the next six to 12 months as we try to move this asset to, to final investment decision, I think is going to be um, incredibly exciting. Um, so Nathan, um, uh, back to you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, just repeating, if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the Q&A panel within Zoom. Um, your first question comes from Andrew Livy. Um, he's, he's asked for a bit more information. So he's asked, can you explain Marvel's exposure to evolution? I'm um, saying, for example, if um, Evolution's price doubles, what is the impact on Marvel? Got it. Um, so Marvel's taking $2 million in cash and $10 million worth of shares in Evolution out of this transaction. Um, that $10 million worth of shares uh, is 50 million shares, basically 31% of Evolution. Um, and so uh, what was it if Evolution goes from 20 cents to 40 cents? Uh, so then Marvel's uh, $10 million investment would be worth $20 million. Um, 
which I guess would work out roughly at about two cents a share. So um, um, that's probably what it means is I guess every every 20 cent movement in evolution um, uh, would be roughly a two cent movement in, in Marvel. Uh, longer term, um, the Marvel board will need to consider its options um, uh, with respect to that investment, um, which could include anything uh, up to an in-species distribution back to our shareholders. Thank you. Your uh, next question comes from Claudia Ma. Um, she has asked, how does EV1 mining practices differ from an environmental point of view to traditional practices? Yeah, look, I think the mining practices will be very similar, but something that we're investigating, I guess a lot of operations in Africa um, use diesel power and our DFS um, uh, assume the same. Um, but one of the optimizations we're looking at at the moment is uh, creating a, a hybrid solar diesel um, solution. And um, Arch are actually an, an investor. They've got their own Africa, African Renewable Power Fund. And so one of the groups they've invested in um, are working with us on, uh, uh, on a hybrid uh, sort of uh, solar, uh, solar diesel solution. We're also looking at uh, electric trucks. We're looking at carbon offsets um, and a number of things. The actual mining itself um, would still be using um, drill and blast excavators, uh, load and haul, all those sorts of things, but trying to make sure that the power sources are uh, uh, to the best possible uh, extent um, uh, renewable. Thank you. Um, you've now got a series of questions from Andrew Harrington. Um, so the first one is regarding, he's asked, is there a free carried interest with the Tanzanian government? Uh, yes, so um, the uh, mining legislation in Tanzania, uh, uh, which changed in 2017, introduced a 16% um, government free carried interest. Uh, the, the economics numbers that we've, uh, we've put forward uh, represent a 100% basis. Um, and uh, yeah, the government do, uh, as part of the taxes and royalty regime, collect a 16% free carry. Thank you. His next question has asked is, any offtake partners, partnerships for product? Yeah, I guess over the last six or seven years, we've signed a number of MOUs and LOIs and, and things like that. Um, how the graphite market works um, is that, um, well, pricing is set between buyer and seller in the months leading up to the first supply of, uh, of product. So, um, these offtake agreements that are getting announced, they're not like an offtake agreement in the copper, copper space, which is what you might term a, a take or pay agreement. Um, at best, they're a, a demonstration of intent rather than necessarily being binding. Um, and this has been the challenge with uh, debt providers um, is, is exactly that. Um, we, um, I guess, knowing this many years ago, the strategy that we had taken um, was not to limit ourselves to signing agreements with three or four um, different parties, knowing that they, um, uh, they're not bound by that. Um, we went wider and um, uh, there's probably 20 customers within China. I'd say there's almost 40 customers in Europe or the US. Uh, this is just for concentrate that have tested product that have um, demonstrated an interest. Um, and, and same goes for micronized graphite and expandable graphite as well. I'd say over the next um, next six months, the intention would be to announce um, a, a MOUs or letters of intent with our, our chosen end users there. Um, but you won't see this company calling them binding offtake agreements, uh, I don't believe. Thank you. Um, were, was any of the material from the pilot plants, pilot plant run sent to customers? Yes, so our first pilot plant run was done in 2017. Um, second, and, and that was sent to customers. Uh, our flow sheet changed a little bit um, prior to the DFS or during our PFS. Um, and uh, that was a 30 tonne pilot plant run done at SGS Lakefield in Canada, uh, produced about three tonnes of concentrate. Um, and um, yes, that's all, uh, or not all, but there's plenty of it still there, but we've sent um, uh, as much as, as we could to customers. Uh, we are actually gonna rebrand that um, as evolution product and um, uh, redistribute it to our, our targeted partners as well. And regarding the advanced materials, the project location? Yeah, um, so the, the two in, within the DFS, um, the intention is to do micronized graphite in Tanzania. Um, it's, uh, it's really just an extra piece of milling and bagging equipment 
um, that uh, can sort of be bolted onto the back end of the plant. Um, uh, in terms of expandable, that was a toll treatment um, arrangement. Uh, you need to be close to uh, uh, the supply of, uh, of acids and things for, to produce expandable graphite. And so the toll treatment was going to be through China. So deliver the concentrate um, to the port. Um, their logistics person would handle it from the port through to their plant. Um, produce the expandable, package it to our requirements, bring it back to the port, and we would handle the shipping um, to uh, to our targeted customers in uh, in the UK and, and Europe. Um, in terms of the other, um, well, we're looking at anodes, as I mentioned. Um, uh, we probably do want to understand sort of globally um, uh, where the best place is for those things, and um, uh, certainly cheap power is a, is a big driver, and, and labour is probably the other and driver of costs in that space. If we're going to be building something, we need it to be sustainable economically, not just um, not just from an ESG point of view. Um, but the intention is to uh, take proven technology um, to one of those locations and um, and maybe even uh, longer term have a hub in um, in multiple continents. Thank you. And just to clarify, um, he's asked: has has the free carried interest been finalised with the government? No, so no company has yet signed a uh, uh, framework agreement, as my understanding. The um, legislation was changed in 2017. There was a regulation introduced um, oh, probably almost a year ago now. Um, there's some additional clarifications that need to be sought. Um, we've got a country manager uh, in Tanzania who's worked with us for the last, uh, last eight years there, um, ex very senior government official, um, but has been in, in business for the last sort of 20 years, but highly capable of uh, working through that negotiation for us. And um, uh, an, another one of those news flow items in the coming weeks is going to be um, uh, some additional appointments in country to really, um, uh, I guess, bulk up our, um, our capability there. So uh, we're confident over this uh, period pre-final investment decision that um, we'll be able to, to tie that up into a framework agreement. Next question, do you plan on reporting or incorporating ESG metrics in your inaugural financial results? Yeah, whether well, they're in the financial results, um, so that the ESG program is going to be extensive. We've signed up to a group called the Digby, um, which is D-I-G-B-E-E, -E, um, a group created an online self-reporting platform for ESG um, based out of the UK. Um, so groups like uh, BlackRock, Orion Mining Finance, a lot of the brokers um, have said that um, the mining industry, this whole uh, greenwashing phenomenon, the mining industry uh, has a unique set of risks. And um, this uh, group, the Digby and, and a specialist ESG consultancy that they use called Satala, um, basically will go in, Evolution will self-report um, into that. There's over 100 questions in the questionnaire to fill out. It's quite extensive um, and they'll come in and give you an ESG score. Uh, initially, that score will remain internal um, and over the next six months, um, as we finalise that uh, ESG program we've committed to with Arch, um, we'll be able to come out and, and report that score. So it'll be a, and then from that point forwards, it will be, um, uh, it'll be out in the open. We've also signed up to a group called Social Suite um, who assists the company in, um, uh, in reporting uh, all these metrics. So the most important thing is um, firstly ticking the boxes, but then uh, reporting how you tick those boxes. Um, we don't employ slave labour, we don't employ uh, miners, we don't uh, all sorts of things. But the question is, where have you said that on your website or in a public uh, uh, publication? So whether it becomes an annual sustainability report in our annual report or uh, a number of these statements are made somewhere on our website. Um, you can be assured that uh, that it will be transparent and, and public. Thanks, Phil. There's no further questions at this time, so I'll hand back to you for closing remarks. Yeah, no worries, Nathan. Um, yeah, thanks for all the questions. Um, again, yeah, thanks for everyone getting on board. Um, Evolution's looking really exciting. The book was um, was really tight. We've got Arch on board. It's not often in my career I've been able to see, um, uh, I guess, all the stars aligning with the commodity um, and, uh, and all of that as well. So um, I would urge everyone to, uh, whilst I am expecting it all to, to go well, 
um, take a, a longish term view on this as well. We're in the right sector. We've got great financial backers. Um, so this could be one to, to hold for some time and, um, uh, and hopefully really make some multiples. Um, from anyone on the line that's a Marvel shareholder, um, I have no doubt this is going to be value accretive to us. Um, and, um, and we'll continue our, our gold exploration in Mali, which is uh, looking really positive as well. So I look forward to keep everyone, everyone updated. And um, yeah, again, uh, feel free to reach out to the company. Um, Trevor and Michael uh, are absolutely running things from here and um, yeah, it should be an exciting time.